191 have been confirmed negative. There are 193 people in self-isolation and followed by public health. If you are feeling unwell or experiencing symptoms of COVID-19, which includes fever or cough or difficulty breathing, please call 811 to speak to a registered nurse. A registered nurse will provide you with guidance on next steps and what it is that you need to do to protect yourself and your loved ones. Another option is for people to take the online self-assessment tool to determine your risk for COVID-19. The online self-assessment tool is available on our 811 and provincial government COVID-19 websites. The websites are gov.nl.ca slash COVID-19 or 811.healthline.ca. Extra resources are in place at 811 to ensure we are prepared to deal with COVID-19 and the call volume. People have been waiting for long periods of time to connect with 811. Uh, right now, there is a five minute wait to get your call answered by 811 and there are 735 people waiting to hear back from an RN. However, there are 14 new RNs starting this week, so this will improve. Also, a reminder that the self-assessment tool is available online and many questions can be addressed by visiting our website at gov.nl.ca slash COVID-19. I want to let people know that if you are experiencing symptoms, you will be put in self-isolation and a test will be arranged through public health who will come to your home if necessary to administer the test. Please do not visit your family physician's office and unless it is a medical emergency, please do not go to your emergency department. You should stay at home and call 811. When you are in self-isolation, such as when returning from in international travel, you need to stay at home. You must avoid contact with others in your home. Stay in a separate room away from other people in your home as much as possible. Use a separate bathroom if you have one. If you are in a room with other people, keep a distance of at least two arms lengths. Do not share dishes, glasses, or utensils. If you experience symptoms while in self-isolation, contact 811. At this point, you will need to continue with self-isolation until public health advises otherwise. If you do not develop symptoms, you need to remain isolated for 14 days after your exposure to a case of COVID-19 or after you return from international travel. We need the 14 day isolation because this is the incubation period of the virus. Most people fall sick within five to six days after exposure, but some have become sick up until the 14th day. This is why we need that 14 day period of time. Social distancing is a term applied to certain measures that are taken by public health to stop, slow down, or contain the spread of a highly contagious virus. For example, I have asked that you to avoid crowds and maintain a two arms length distance from each other. Social distancing is particularly important for the vast majority of us who are well. We all need to adhere to this. It is up to us to ensure that we help the major effort required to contain this virus. I applaud the businesses, organizations, and municipalities who have been closing their doors and encouraging people to remain at home. As I referenced yesterday, these measures did make a difference in other parts of the world, like China, and we need to do our part as a province to contain the spread. Now that schools are suspended indefinitely, I ask parents not to hold play dates or sleepovers for their children. We are in a pandemic and everyone needs to take steps to protect themselves and their loved ones. I know that this is, a, is frightening for some, while others may feel confused or anxious about what is happening. <clears throat> Please know that these feelings are normal. It's a normal reaction to what we are going through. You are not alone and know that many others feel the same way. I encourage people to use mental health resources we have in our province for support and guidance. Visit bridgethegap.ca to access these services. You can also call the Provincial Warm Line or the Mental Health Crisis Line if you need to talk or if you're experiencing a crisis. Our work is ongoing and is going to continue for some time. This will not <clears throat> be a short-term situation. 
With that said, we are prepared and the system is working well and as it should under these pressures. Thank you to organizations and businesses that have already voluntarily shut down services. Our recommendation is that public spaces should be closed. This would include businesses such as gyms, fitness facilities, including yoga classes, bars, cinemas, performance spaces, and arenas. We also recommend that St. Patrick's Day celebrations for this evening be canceled. We recommend restaurants reduce capacity by 50% to allow adequate social distancing. Takeout orders, deliveries, and drive-through services can continue to operate and should be encouraged if people choose to use the restaurants. Rest restaurants should not be offering buffet service. People have been asking about mass gatherings and previous guidelines have given you numbers. As things evolve, the message is that we want to keep you and your loved ones safe. My message is to avoid gatherings where you cannot keep a distance of two arm's lengths from others. And that can be a, a gathering as small as 10 people. So you need to bear that in mind. To stay safe, wash your hands frequently with soap and water or use hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol. Avoid touching your face. Stay at home if you are not well. And regularly clean high touch surfaces such as doorknobs, remotes, and phones. People over 60 and those with underlying medical conditions are at increased risk for severe illness. We recommend these individuals avoid <coughs> going out in public as much as possible. If you know someone who may need assistance, please reach out to help. Offer to run errands or pick up groceries. If you are an individual with higher risk and have to go out in public, please wash your hands frequently, avoid crowds, and limit time outside the home. We applaud businesses that have set up specific hours for those at high risk to visit. Remember, it is still safe to be outdoors. We encourage playing in your backyard, going for hikes, snowshoeing, but please respect the principle of social or physical distancing. The measures we have introduced over the past several days will help us flatten the curve and reduce the spread of the virus. These measures are no doubt inconvenient. We are not overreacting. We have seen how this has spread in other countries and provinces. We need to act now. We must do what we can to detect, detect and contain this virus and to alleviate the spread within the community. I appreciate everyone's patience and cooperation during this difficult time. And while this may be disruptive to our daily lives, and for some it may be overwhelming, we must all work together to stay healthy and do what we can to manage COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fitzgerald. <clears throat> it's not much more than two months now since the end of the uh, storm event in St. John's. And at that time, you saw how Newfoundlanders and Labradorians came together to help each other. Uh, we need to do that now, but we need to do that in a slightly different way, perhaps one we're not really familiar with, and that is to keep two arms lengths apart um, uh, and to limit uh, social interaction in that way uh, and contact. Uh, that's an important social responsibility. It is not possible for the healthcare system to do all this by itself. We need our neighbors to acknowledge uh, their responsibilities if they've traveled, their responsibilities if they feel sick, uh, and simple uh, good neighborliness now has to involve at least two arm's lengths. One of the challenges with the storm event as it wore on and the isolation that that produced was again challenges around mental health. We saw then an uptick in demand for the warm line, uh, for uh, the crisis line, uh, and these services uh, remain available and have been um, reinforced. Um, Dr. Fitzgerald mentioned bridge and the bridge the gap. .ca, that's two Ps. Um, this is a mental health resource which we set up. It contains tools to, to help really with mental wellness rather than necessarily deal with uh, mental uncertainty. 
Uh, we have doorways, which we have, through the regional health authorities, regarded now as an essential service. Uh, it is still available, uh, and there is still no appointment needed. It's a walk-in service. Uh, if I had to mention one uh, telephone number uh, for uh, mental health services, I would draw people's attention to the mental health crisis line, one 737 4668 Again, you are not alone. Uh, if you have someone who's feeling worried uh, and in need of uh, some company, there's a telephone, there's FaceTime, there's Skype, there's the things that Granny uses to keep in touch with the kids in Alberta. Those things have to become a better part of our life uh, over the next little while. As Dr. Fitzgerald says, this is not going to be a short-term thing. Uh, we need to settle down for the long haul. I think at that point, I think it would probably be best use of everyone's time if I um, let uh, questions come from the floor. So thank you for your patience. A lot of people are wondering about your analysis. What are you looking for in terms of a sign that things are going well? And what are you looking for as sort of the next step where we may need to tighten restrictions further, make some of these voluntary measures more mandatory? So at the moment, what we see are, with our case here in particular, we've seen household contacts that have been affected, and those are not unexpected. So if we were to start seeing cases where we were not able to trace back to either travel or a contact, that would be concerning for us, certainly. Um, but there are other consider considerations that would make us uh, determine if we needed to use mandatory measures uh, if we felt that um, people weren't complying, for example, with, with recommendations, then we may have to consider that. There has been some discussion around testing and uh, other jurisdictions have said, for example, for every person that we're seeing positive, we believe that there are several other people who may have it and either have mild or no symptoms at all. Are we doing enough testing? Should we be testing more people in order to ensure that we're catching any of the cases that we have in this province right now? So right, right now what we know is the biggest risk is travel. Uh, and we are asking people who are coming home now to isolate themselves for the incubation period uh, after they get back into the country. So at the moment, we are still testing symptomatic people who have had that exposure history, whether it be travel or exposure to a known case. Um, so that's where we're leaving at this point because we want to make sure we're getting uh, the most uh, bang for a buck, I guess, with regard to the testing. The woman who first tested uh, presumptive positive from Labrador Grenfell region, is that now a confirmed or is that still presumptive? We're still at presumptive at this point, yes. We're okay. just waiting for the test to come back. Um, as far as contract tracing has gone with this woman, have we seen that to now its full extent or are we still expecting more positive cases from her travel? So there, contact tracing has started in that case and it is still ongoing as we speak, obviously, and now we have two new cases, so contact tracing has to happen for both of those cases as well. So this contact tracing is ongoing. Um, we, uh, there have been other people tested in relation to this case, so we may see more positive cases. Um, Dr. Hagee, I've heard from people in community health that nurses didn't have any test kits to go out to patients' houses yesterday and do these tests and that they were also concerned because there were no masks. Can you speak to any of that? Have you heard these concerns? Um, they haven't been brought to the department. Uh, we have a, um, a provincial uh, emergency operations center as well as the health ones. Uh, the health authorities have arrangements whereby if one area is short of particular supplies, uh, there is an ability to move those from areas where there's a relative surfeit. We have um, a bulk order in through our national purchasing arrangement as well as through our uh, own uh, provincial system and we've also arranged with the federal government to access our emergency stockpile. Um, as far as the test kits are concerned, Health Canada has actually uh, gone through a rapid approval process and we now have two different test kits which have been validated so those are available now. So uh, if there was a transient uh, lack in one area uh, then that should be filled. I haven't been made aware of a shortage or or issues in a systemic way. Uh, I think you spoke to this yesterday, but can you speak to how many ventilators we do have here in the province? Certainly. Across the province, the grand total is currently 156. Um, we have um, 
uh, capacity we feel, uh, given we've got flu season, uh, the issue of uh, the severity of COVID is, is really key in terms of the demand that might be placed on those services. Um, we have three cases. Uh, currently, each of them are, are manageable at home. Uh, and as Dr. Fitzgerald said yesterday, a significant proportion of people with this illness, it's a self-limiting condition that can be managed in the community and doesn't actually require hospitalization. The percentage of people who might need ventilation is actually single digits, maybe of the order of 2%. I'm not sure if this was answered earlier yesterday, but I'm curious how many test kits are in the province right now, and are we expecting any to be ordered in or brought in from feds? We, we have an order in for more, uh, both provincially and nationally and through NS. In terms of the numbers that are in the province at present, I don't have that number. I can find it for you. Okay, perfect. Um, I'm wondering if uh, maybe Dr. Fitzgerald or, or, or Dr. Hage, if you could uh, explain the process of contact tracing. How does that work? What, you, what is the process there? So when we have a case, uh, a public health nurse or a communicable disease control nurse will go in and speak to the patient. They will uh, find out every person that that person may have been in contact with, every close contact that that person may have had um, over the period that they were infectious. Um, and so they will get a list of names and then they will go on to contact with those people to determine if they have symptoms, first of all, and if they do, they'll be immediately self-isolated and uh, a testing will be arranged. And if those people don't have symptoms, they will be asked to stay at home on, on quarantine, essentially, because they're well. They'll be asked to stay at home uh, or stay in a place where they can be away from other people and to monitor themselves for 14 days. Uh, on, and uh, if they don't get symptoms, that's great. And if they do, then they'll arrange for them to be tested. Um, and based on the contact tracing that I guess has happened so far, is there any evidence of community spread uh, within this province right now? None at this time. Dr. Fitzgerald, you've talked about the need for privacy for these patients, and that's why you're not releasing further information. There is genuine fear and even sometimes even panic within the Labrador area right now because people are saying, I don't know if it's my community where these people are. How do I know if I'm at risk? I'm now assuming that it's my area. And why not provide some more specific information about what area it's in in order to alleviate those concerns from lots of other people who uh, don't know whether or not it's in their community right now. I think at the moment, what we need to assume with COVID-19 is that you need to be aware anywhere. So it's almost like what we call universal precautions in what we practice in hospitals. So we just assume that you assume that there is an infectious disease out there that you don't want to catch and you take the precautions to make sure that you don't. So if people stay home, if people wash their hands carefully, if they practice um, you know, good hand hygiene, not touching their face, social distancing measures, then they will reduce their risk of uh, contracting the COVID-19 virus. You talked a lot about businesses uh, that are, I guess, customer facing um, and some of those that shut down. What about other corporations who, you know, it may be call centers or insurance or other, you know, where, um, what are you recommending businesses do there in terms of trying to make sure that um, people limit their exposure and reduce their risk? We would recommend that as much as possible that businesses try to arrange for employees to work from home, to think about who's essential to their operations and to reduce the, the contact between employees in the workplace as much as possible. And obviously, if you have to have employees come in, um, then to make sure you're providing good uh, uh, hand sanitizers and, and uh, keeping your office clean. The two new presumptive positive cases are their symptoms mild? Um, how long have they been developing? So, uh, yet yeah, they both have mild symptoms and they're both um, at home. Uh, was theirs through contact or were they also involved with travel? No, theirs were through contact. Uh, 
Um, Schools are going to be busy places over the next two days as students come in to try and get supplies. Uh, doesn't it seem a bit counterproductive to have these students all gathering one place um, over these next two days in light of what we've said about trying to have uh, limiting the large gatherings and contact that people may have? So uh, I believe the schools have put measures in place to reduce the number of students who will be in the school at one time. They've certainly um, restricted anyone who's traveled or who's been in contact with a case from going into the school. Uh, and they have um, um, sort of have staggered times for the students going in. I think my understanding. Yes, no, that's right. I, I've seen that uh, with uh, some of the schools on the West Coast. I think one of the key things here for certain students, particularly with public exams or who might graduate this year, uh, it's important that they have access to homework packages or their books or their teaching materials um, or whatever the school district and the teachers advise that will enable them to help complete their year and satisfy their graduation requirements. I uh, got a question about uh, things like registered massage therapists or hairdressers or any of those sorts of uh, professions that rely on personal contact. You obviously can't do someone's hair if you're two meters away. What's your recommendation about uh, businesses like that? So at the moment, our biggest worry is about mass gatherings. Um, we are recommending social distancing. Obviously, uh, anyone who has traveled or who may be at risk with exposure should not be attending any of these types of appointments. Uh, but uh, these people will have to, you know, these businesses will have to use their best judgment and determine what uh, at this time is best for them. Uh, you mentioned things like like uh, restaurants, you know, to, to reduce uh, to a fifty percent capacity. There is there a particular moment when uh, you know when restaurants and and some of the businesses w you know would be asked to close down? Is there a certain moment where that that where that option will become? That may happen, absolutely. Um, you know, if we start to see spread within the community, um, we would certainly want to reduce any risk that people could have of uh, any kind of gathering. So uh, those will be things we would have to consider as time goes on. And I, I know that uh, you know uh, Ontario, of course, uh, declared a state, state of emergency on, on, on this front. You know, I, I, I don't want to get too far too far ahead of things, but you know, is that something that that, that is within the realm of, of discussion at this point? So we have uh, really good, new, strong public health legislation that allows us to uh, uh, to think about a public health emergency, so that we wouldn't have to necessarily call a full state of emergency uh, and certainly that those are discussions that we're having and we're looking at we're not doing that right now um, because people have been compliant and and businesses have been um, following recommendations and we really very much appreciate that uh, but if if that's something we need to consider in the future we will I think from uh, the, the, the view from, I understand it, of Ontario's action is under their regulations and legislation, it allows money to flow more freely into certain areas that wouldn't otherwise have access to that. Um, we have not, through our whole government approach, become aware of any uh, bottlenecks in terms of resources that we can't meet or get round with our current setup. So we haven't gone down that road because I think there's a difference between how we would operate now with our new uh, Public Health and Health Promotion Act uh, in this situation uh, versus uh, the, the more traditional states of emergency. But anything's possible in the next little while. Um, homeless, homelessness advocates are asking if there's going to be any public hand washing stations or more emergency shelters put in place. Um, emergency shelters fall under now under Newfoundland and Labrador Housing and CSSD. I have reached out to Minister Dempster uh, to make her aware of communications that I've received, for example, from the gathering place. We actually have a specific vulnerable persons group set up as part of our emergency structure to look at issues like that because the homelessness piece is one area. Uh, you know, food insecurity with food banks, for example, has become an issue today. So we'll looking at ways to do that in a way that respects the principles Dr. Fitzgerald and her public health team uh, are, are suggesting and we, we'll be working on that over the next little while. And when we're looking at social distancing, uh, we know a big mode of transportation here is ferries. Uh, we're still having a lot of people asking if we're going to change uh, legislation or any regulations to allow people to remain in their cars. I know that's 
with Transport Canada, you'd mentioned this before. I just don't know if we've made any changes in that approach. Um, uh, certainly, you've seen the change with BC Ferries, and I believe Lithuania, somebody uh, drew to my attention this morning, has, has made alterations to their ferry requirements. Uh, I've been in contact with the Minister of Transportation and Works, and my understanding is they may have some uh, announcement to make around ferries in the not too distant future. Um, some students have raised concerns at Memorial University about having to attend classes until tomorrow evening. With the announcement yesterday and the closure of all schools across the province and CNA and the daycares, do you think it was appropriate for Mon to also stay open, continue to stay open until tomorrow evening? They've actually changed it just as we walked in okay. here. Their classes closed okay, tonight at, at, at 5 o'clock. So, uh, yeah, things change very quickly in the world uh, today. So uh, I can answer that question very easily. <laughs> Thank you. Hearing some concern from pregnant women, uh, they haven't heard any advice. What is their risk level from coronavirus and is there anything in particular they should be doing in order to protect themselves? So um, from what we know right now, it does not appear that pregnant women are affected uh, more severely. However, as with any respiratory virus in pregnancy, that's always a concern. So we would recommend that uh, pregnant women follow the same rules. Stay at home if you can, social distancing, wash your hands carefully, avoid touching your face, uh, all of those same types of things. This regards uh, yesterday's announcement with uh, daycares and day homes. I'm not sure if either of you can answer it. Um, many people having questions around if they're going to be paid and how that's going to work for daycare workers. One of the things uh, we've reached out to the federal government about is there's 10 billion, 11 billion in total on the table for uh, economic stimulus and help. My understanding is that uh, the federal government are making announcements possibly while we're actually doing this media availability around uh, those kind of issues. But certainly uh, we're conscious of the need to look at the, uh, the EI uh, uh, accessibility in terms of uh, how we advocate to our federal colleagues about changing that if need be and we're certainly a bit conscious um, through uh, AESL of potential gaps that may appear between um, income support uh, and EI so uh, those are works in progress and as I say my understanding is that the federal government are making some announcements further announcements about that over the course of today uh, I haven't seen those obviously but uh, watch this space I suspect again by five o'clock this could be different again. Uh, keeping in mind that we do know the Prime Minister is making an announcement as we speak, uh, Ontario going into a state of emergency, knowing that we potentially at some point, not saying this is happening today or tomorrow, could go into a public health state of emergency. Have we spoken with finances to how people are going to be able to cope through this? We already know we had a two-week break during Snowmageddon. Um, many people are already struggling to pay mortgages and loans and car loans. Uh, what's being done there? Um, I know that um, uh, across relevant government departments, the uh, uh, mortgage issue has been looked at. Um, I know that everyone is very conscious of the fact that uh, with people, um, employment being vulnerable in terms of layoffs, particularly with hospitality industry, this is top of mind for, uh, for a couple of departments in government. I don't have an answer at the moment. We're looking at it. We have limited fiscal capacity to do much, uh, more than uh, uh, we've thought of already. We're kind of waiting to see what the feds are going to come out with. Uh, and we've certainly are begun discussions about the 10 billion that they talked about with the economic stimulus. We've been told about a down payment from the $1 billion in health care money. So, uh, you know, again, this is a, an evolving situation. And if you look back 48 hours or 72 hours compared with where we are, you could see the trajectory in another 72 hours could be different again. Uh, two questions. Uh, one about malls. They continue to be open. What's your recommendation in terms of, because that is generally a place where you see a lot of people uh, specifically gathering. What's your recommendation there? So, uh, you know, we have to be careful because certain essential services need to stay open, so drug stores and grocery stores and that sort of thing. So uh, we would recommend that employers certainly try to keep their uh, high-touch surfaces as clean as possible, frequently clean those, uh, have employees uh, protected with uh, proper hand washing and hand sanitizers being available, and for people to avoid going out um, unless it's absolutely necessary uh, and reduce their, uh, the, reduce their risk of exposure. 
Other what, problems, oh, Peter, oh. sorry, one of the paradoxes is if you look at what happened during the storm event where shops were open for limited periods, you saw the lineups outside those places. Our problem now is trying to prevent people clumping together and paradoxically the evidence would suggest that you're probably far better having shops and malls open way longer. Uh, my recollection when Walmart was open at four o'clock in the morning before Christmas is it was a really good time to go shopping. The other question is about testing centers. We've seen other provinces establish these as a way. Uh, now that we're seeing higher numbers of testing, are there any plans to establish similar centers here? So those uh, discussions have been ongoing. At the moment, our public health uh, staff have been able to do the testing that needs to be done. So we've been able to keep people in their homes to get tested, which is the ideal situation. Uh, and if uh, that changes, obviously, we will have to reconsider. Yeah. Um, with Metrobus, is Metrobus still currently operating as normal? Uh, my understanding is they haven't changed. Uh, that's um, as of walking in here. So I, I don't really know what their plans are. That's a, uh, a city jurisdiction. Um, but uh, we, again, there's certain infrastructure that's kind of critical. Uh, you know, if you need to get to a drugstore or you need to get to the mall to get groceries or whatever, you have to have a means of doing it. A Metrobus we saw in um, the storm event played a pivotal role in, in enabling that. So I think, you know, whether and, and how much that's regarded as an essential service is a discussion between government, uh, uh, not health, but government in, in general uh, and the city of St. John's. And uh, uh, I, I, those discussions would lie in other departments. Well, Dr. Fitzgerald, do you think places like crowding in like a bus is, you know, maybe something that needs to be limited in some capacity? Well, I think certainly it would have to be looked at and, and uh, obviously there would have to be some discussions around how we would exactly be able to do that. Hopefully with people staying at home and not going out unless they absolutely have to, um, that we would see less traffic on the bus. We have goods being imported from out of province, uh, out of country. What screening measures are being put in place uh, for these coming in and for those transporting it into the province? My understanding is the federal government have uh, issued some specific guidelines to truck drivers crossing the border, uh, to airline crews and cabin crews uh, and those kind of things. So I think that is being examined. Uh, it's uh, being transborder is a federal jurisdiction uh, and again, uh, I suspect that uh, those things are under review by the federal government on a frequent basis, just as the kind of things under provincial jurisdiction, you've seen how they've evolved in the last 36 hours. This is uh, a stressful and can be a very scary time for a lot of people. Schools now closing. How should parents um, inform their children on these events that are going on? That's very interesting. In actual fact, I think CBC this morning carried a, um, a, an item as I was driving into work, 7.15 or something, about um, uh, a, a, a sports coach, uh, how, to, uh, how to entertain your kids. Uh, it will be challenging, quite frankly, uh, as any parent will know. Um, I think you need to speak to children in a way that they appreciate, uh, appropriate for their age. Uh, a, a, as Dr. Fitzgerald said, and as we've talked about, there is an element of fear and there is an element of panic. Uh, and I think it's helpful to insulate them uh, to some of that, but explain to them the necessity of, you know, not hugging granny quite as often as you used to, uh, because we know there is a risk in terms of transmission. And that's going to be hard. It's certainly going to be a challenge. Uh, and uh, I, there is no easy answer for that. Um, you mentioned public health emergency earlier. How would a public health emergency be different or distinct from a state of emergency? Uh, so a public health emergency is declared in the event of a public health threat. Um, so, for example, the coronavirus at this point or COVID-19 is certainly a public health threat. Uh, and it would uh, have to be called in the event that special measures would need to be taken in order for uh, us to be able to control that event. And uh, so there are, it's variable as the events can be variable and, and we would have to look at uh, uh, several different things, for example, community spread or uh, compliance with recommendations and those sorts of things before we could make those decisions to call it a, a public health emergency. Where's, sorry. Sorry, I just have a quick question here. Um, 
somebody asking that in regards to testing, uh, any discussion on a second local lab to do presumptive testing? I'm imagining we're going to start to see quite a few coming in there. Obviously, I know it still has to go to the national lab, but in terms of presumptive testing for here. So all of our microbiology testing is done at our public health and microbiology lab in the province. It is the referral center for the province. So everything that will be done will be sent here. And, and if resources, if we need to improve resources at that lab, then that's what will happen. Thank you. Okay. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you.